Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I hope you enjoyed uh, last session before me here in the same table. And um, I would like to invite you for this session now. Um, this is the session Research Without Borders. Research does not stop at national borders. How can researchers and communities of large international research projects be supported in collaborating and sharing data all over the world? Now in this session, two speakers will share their challenges online with us and how they overcame their cross-border collaboration challenges. I'd like to welcome senior member of staff of CERN IT department, and uh, CERN is a European organization for nuclear research. It's one of the world's largest ones and most respected centers for scientific research. He has more than 15 years of experience in distributed computing infrastructure, fostering several collaborations with academia and industries. I'm talking about Joao Fernandes. Joao, welcome. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Very nice. Uh, You're how welcome. Are you? How are you Hope doing? It's okay. Good. Very good. Very good. Yes. Now, yes. Um, good to hear. I have one question and then the virtual floor is yours from your living room, mm -hmm. I think. So, sorry. Say, sorry. I, I said I have one question for you. <laughs> But yeah. uh, the, and then the, the, the virtual stage is yours. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, from your living room, or is it your work room? Well, no, this is my, uh, my uh, teleworking, uh, this is my teleworking uh, office for the last, uh, yeah, for the last year, let's say, most of the year. Yeah. Nice, it looks Not like a nice place. Yes, it is, it is, we try, we try, a nice decor. It's my wife's, not me, but uh, <laughs> yes, it's a nice decor. With the, with the world <laughs> behind you. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, my question for you, Joao, is to what extent do you collaborate with SURF, Dutch universities and researchers, and in which way? Well, um, so CERN has several projects that uh, I'm going to talk about some of them, and several projects that are with, um, with public organizations and with the, with the NRANs and with the, with the national um, research networks. Um, so we have a very strong energy physics community in the Netherlands, uh, based on NICEF and others and in, uh, in other centers. And of course, SURF is a very good partner of us in several of these initiatives. Right. And also EC projects, EC funded projects as well. Great. Well, the floor is yours. Um, just to make sure if you can sit a bit more still, uh, that will help sure. viewers. Yeah, sorry. Um, that will help people really listen to your story. Sorry, it's not, it's fine. not live. So, fine. yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, it's fine. See you in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, see you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Nice, very nice introduction. Um, so, I, uh, I'll talk about, uh, let me just try, yeah, so the, all the, uh, all the, um, all the um, uh, setup is working. So, I'll talk about CERN and what we are doing so i I, uh, I divided the presentation in essentially um i'll just try to stay still i'll divide this presentation in, in essentially four uh aspects so we'll talk about cern and the mission and the objectives most of you or some of you already know what are the mission is and the objectives are what are the new competing challenges for our researchers and for our community some examples of these joint r d initiatives and i heard on the panel before um things like co-creation co-development and i'm going to touch a bit on that between between the public sector and also the private sector, and then the summary in the end uh, with some of the conclusions. Um, so to stay on time, the 15 minutes, because otherwise I'll be cut. So CERN, uh, what is CERN? An international organization that straddles over the Swiss and the French border. So you can imagine how complicated this can be sometimes. Um, uh, we have facilities for fundamental physics. So our core business is fundamental research in particle physics. It's an international organization, 23 member states, uh, 1.2 billion uh, Swiss francs of budget, um, 2,200 staff and 13,000 associates. So associates is people not necessarily on the payroll of CERN, but uses CERN facilities to, uh, to do their research. We have our member states. We have also associate member states, not necessarily European. So most of the member states are European except Israel. Um, and then we have associate member states, observers, and a number of um, non-member states that have collaboration agreements for research. Um, so one of the, the our flagship um, experiment is the Large Hadron Collider. So is the is the uh, 
the uh, the circle that you see there um, straddling through from the Swiss and French border. Um, and the, the four flagship experiments that you see there are CMS, Atlas, Alice, and LHCB. So in terms of computing or computing uh, uh, um, um, challenges, we are talking about a debit of one petabyte per second from all these experiments. Not all this data is processed, not all this data is stored, not all this data is computed, but that's the uh, the debit that we have from, from uh, the LHC. So to, um, to address this challenge, um, what has been created from the beginning of the LHC is the World Computing LHC Computing Grid. Um, the LHC Computing Grid is, it was the, the model of computing to treat all this data across the several CERN members and member states. Um, there is a tier zero that was at CERN, and then we have 42 countries involved with what you call tier twos with 170 centers and tier ones that are a bit bigger than the tier twos, the 13 centers with permanent storage processing and analysis of data. And this represents around 800,000 800, cores, CPU cores, and 800 petabytes of data. So, as you probably also know, the one of the uh, flagship discoveries on the last years has been the Higgs boson. Um, and the Higgs boson is very important because it completes the standard model, but the standard model um, uh, only explains 5% of the universe. So. The, the, the thing is, we now need to find the, the answers and, 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 and do the research for the rest of the 95%, okay? Um, and what you see on the next slide is a bit to contextualize the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the challenge, what you see on the next slide, okay? Uh, what you see in the next slide is the schedule of the LHC. And so, uh, without going too much details, uh, when you see there the curve for run four, run five, run five and run six, of the high luminosity LHC, uh, you have an increase of integrated luminosity. And this means in practical terms that you'll have amounts of data and complexity of data that will be much higher, exponentially much higher than what we have now. Okay? Um, the type of workloads that you uh, that uh, that we are treating with um, are the ones that you see in the picture, essentially. So we have data acquisition workloads that are the data that gets out of the detectors, let's say, uh, and then a set of different workloads with different computing and storage requirements. So we have event reconstruction that essentially is the extraction of high level physics quantities like energy, trajectory, parameters, momentum, etc., uh, from the raw detected data. And then you have the data, data analysis and statistical analysis of that op output on the risk construction. <coughs> That's called event risk construction. All these workloads, um, uh, have different, as I said, have different hardware resources, address of requirements in terms of compute network and storage, essentially. I'm trying to stay still, still. Um, okay, on the next slide, what, what you see there um, is, sorry, um, yeah, so the next slide, what you see there is um, essentially uh, what are the estimates uh, in terms of uh, data, uh, storage data and data on disk, and CPU seconds by type in uh, two of our experiments. And essentially the message is the raw data volume that is, in, is increased exponentially for processing and analysis and the right. technology, yes, it improves every year. And we have very good examples already from yesterday and today, but the estimate of resource needs were 10 times above realistic expectation, okay? So, so we need to come with new models. We need, we need to come with new ways of dealing with all these research data. Um, so as an international organization, CERN is, is following scientific guidelines, international scientific guidelines, and what you see there are three examples of the guidelines that we have. The 2020 update on the European strategy for particle physics, where uh, CERN is invited very much, CERN and the LHC community is invited very much to coordinate R&D efforts with collaborations with science, other fields of science, and we have another field of science that we presented just after me, and also with industry to develop software and computing that are that can exploit these advances of technology that we have in the world. Mm -hmm. um, another one that you see there is the HL LHC software and computing review, also mentioning the, uh, the international landscape of computing, private and public, and in the scope of as well, or in the context of the European Open Science Cloud. And then the International Health Strategy Roadmaps, and just to give you um, some three examples from what I'm going to present afterwards, um, that, that mentioned the need of using HPC, clouds, machine learning tools, frameworks, and explore quantum technologies as well. Um, sorry, I was not in the good slide. Now I am. <laughs> um, so um, then what you see on the, on the next slide is essentially 
um, the paths that are defined on the R&D scope of some of our initiatives for the high luminosity LHC that I talked before to, to, um, to address these computing challenges. And so you have one that is essentially the uh, increase of data center capacity, so increase of on-prem capacity, okay? Um, uh, with hardware accelerators, so FPGAs, GPUs that are very much needed for everything that relates to machine learning, deep learning, um, and derivatives. Um, scale out capacity because uh, I mean the the one of the one of the keys to 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 uh, to accommodate is that the capacity that we have on prime might not be enough for peaks when peaks are needed for 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 some research workloads and so public clouds need to be explored HPC architectures and also any new heterogeneous architectures that might be available and then the uh, change essentially the computing paradigms and 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 and, and trying to englobe on the on the on the computing model things like machine learning deep learning or quantum computing um, as well and um, for this um, uh, to simplify what is where is happening when all this is happening i just um, add two uh, two logos there that are two initiatives that we have of joint r and d so the first one, CERN Open Labs. So it's CERN Open Labs is a joint private partner, private public partnership between CERN, uh, other research labs, but also the industry. And uh, and in, I will see some of the examples of the projects that we are running. And then a very new initiative that uh, started, um, more or less in the same with the same scope with the, the quantum technology initiative that will will have CERN uh, um, coordinating a, a quantum initiative with the industry and with other. Uh, public partners uh, as well. So what you see there on the, this slide is uh, I'll not go through all of them. I'll just I'll just I'll just trying to give you an over a glimpse of what is happening. Um, so these are examples of joint R and D projects that we have at the Open Lab. Um, so they vary from from things in network like or fast simulation or data quality monitoring to software defined networks. Uh, predictive maintenance, um, storage architects, and so the cloud as well, and so on. So these are different projects that are set up uh, in different um, in, in with different partners or with the, with the relevant partners in order to make advances on all those on all those um, aspects. Um, one of them that I was would like to particularly emphasize and to give you some examples afterwards is this scaling out of capacity. So scale out of capacity when you use public cloud. Uh, when you use it heterogeneous, uh, 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 with heterogeneous um, uh, capacity on not not necessarily on prem. So what you see there are uh, a few examples, a uh, few examples of of the way. And I heard as well um, in the panel before things like containerizing containerizing the workflows using Kubernetes and Kubeflow. Um, and these things are happening now. We are federating the in the uh, the on-prem infrastructure that we have at CERN with public clouds like, like GCP or AWS, Oracle, and others, um, and pushing the scale of these workloads. So, so I can give you an example that what you, what you see there on the left is a, a workload and um, and um, a validation workload that is has been that has been performed this this year already. That is breaking the um, the uh, the uh, the. Uh, the barrier of 1,024 GPUs for a single workload to be used on a single cloud, and these 1,024 GPUs are used on-prem and on the cloud, and vice versa, and so in uh, combined. Um, I'm going to explore in more detail these two projects that I put you there in, in the middle, the Cloud Bank and Archiva. So there are two examples of this joint R&D uh, that I mentioned that I mentioned before. So. Um, what is uh, Cloud Bank? So Cloud Bank essentially is an uh, initiative from the NSF in the US, uh, with led by the University of California San Diego, but uh, but um, uh, sponsored by the NSF, where um, we have a framework or a mechanism to make available clouds or a, a public cloud to researchers. Okay, so. The the uh, the problems to solve here are not like clouds are there technically that can be used, but there is more than only the technical uh, the technical deployment. You have all the billing associated to using the cloud and to be cost effective, and you have all the education and outreach that is needed for a research to use effectively the cloud because it's not used is not used to use it. So essentially, what is happening now is that the NSF using Cloud Bank. Um, is responding to solicitations from researchers to uh, to provide funding grants, and the grants for the cloud funds where these research needs to be done is is going through Cloud Bank. 
Okay. Uh, of course, as an American project is is been uh, is been uh, using American hyperscalers mostly, uh, like uh, AWS, Google, Microsoft, and IBM, and is using Strategic Blue as one of the brokers or the clearing house in the middle that is trying to or that tries to optimize the the uh, the um, the workloads that go the the billing of the workloads that go to the cloud and to the cloud resources. Um, so what we are trying to do now, uh, and in a, in a partnership with 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 UCSD, um, we are using this model to do the same thing with our with our researchers. So we have several research, several the LHC workloads on machine learning, on HPC, on quantum computing, that not necessarily have the resources available on prem. Uh, as you know, GPUs, for example, is not something that you can find on-prem at, at the scale of hundreds or thousands. Um, and we are trying to, to, to create this model to be able to complement uh, in a managed way with a managed process the, uh, the, uh, the capacity that we have on-prem. Um, so, what are the objectives of CloudBank? So, CloudBank will allow to, um, first of all, to allow to cover a wide range of research leads organizational units. So we are not talking anymore of having uh, a centralized access to a central IT uh, operation teams, but having these operation teams and also other ways of accessing the cloud, the cloud, the cloud providers in a structured access, several of them in, in order to not be locked to any, any particular vendor. Um, so we are deploying machine learning and uh, HPC and QC use cases. Um, most of them, as I mentioned before, because they don't find uh, currently on-prem the same amounts of capacity that they need for some of the workloads. And the third ob uh, objective is to have trainings and tutorials um, provided by the cloud providers directly so we can increase the, the number of or the, the knowledge of the uh, research personnel with cost efficiency knowledge and mm -hmm. technical knowledge in using heterogeneous uh, services, not only using on-prem, but using on-prem and combining on-prem with, with cloud. Um, for this, for this um, um, development, we are using, we have a memorandum of understanding um, uh, signed between CERN and, and the University of California San Diego. On, on the next slide, what you see there is an example of one of the deployments that I just mentioned. So in this case is a uh, simul detector simulation on Google Cloud using ML, uh, in this case, GANs, uh, gener generative advanced networks, adverse networks um, in, in GPUs and TPUs provided by, by Google. Um, there are several runs already, as I mentioned before, up to the hundreds of GPUs and TPUs. Now the, the, the scale up is going to break to the thousand of GPU barrier and much larger GPU cores, GPU cores as well. Um, Another example that I'd like to uh, to give you is uh, another in another another set of, another project a different project a completely separate project that is called Archiver. This is an AC funded action, what we call a PCP, a, pro a procurement of commercial services. So again, here is where we enter with jargon such as the one that we were using before of co-development and co-creation. So. Uh, Archive is focusing on archiving and data preservation services for the European Open Science Cloud. is an R&D project with companies between the, 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 the public sector and, and companies. Um, and will we'll last for, for three years. It started in 2019, about one year and a half more. And CERN is coordinating the project together with Embol EBI, DESI and, and PIC in Barcelona, bringing three, four different um, types of use cases, high energy physics, astrophysics, Photoneutron and life sciences. So, what is happening here is again an R&D action where there was an R&D scope defined uh, between these four organizations and the companies that uh, that participated on on the on the pre-commercial procurement. Um, essentially, what you see there is the definition of the layers of R&D. We started with R&D in. Uh, layer one that is this basic storage but of course when you talk about data preservation you go beyond storage you go for archiving and it's software that needs to keep take care of all the archiving of, of petabyte scale scientific data and you go up to layer two on preservation layer three on baselines of user services in front of you and then advanced sets like you usability and reproducibility of results independent of the on-prem infrastructure. What you see on the right side is the initial set of use cases that each of these organizations had brought to the project. Uh, some of them are more on the preservation, some of them are more on the archiving side of things, um, but most of them have, 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 have requirements that cover layer one to layer four in terms of R&D. Um, 
uh, what you see here are the three companies that have been selected for, 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 for prototypes, uh, the three consortium. There's not, not only one company, there are several companies, so they form consortia. Um, it's a competitive process. We have a design phase where we have five of them. Now we have prototypes where we'll have only had three of them, okay. and we'll have a pilot phase. We'll have two of them. One of them is going to be eliminated. We have all the consortia being led by European um, um, companies, some of them using the hyperscalers to offer this uh, petabyte scale um, um, uh, capacity. And I, I get to my last slide now, uh, that is a summary. Um, and so just to uh, wrap up what you saw there, it was very fast, a lot of information, but very fast. So international scientific collaboration, like the, one that, the ones that CERN is participating, must exploit the advances in information technology and data science and this is not this is now happening as well very much with with the private sector so for these the solutions or the at least the uh, uh, initiatives that we have are around this fostering these centers of excellence of joint r d between cern or between the public sector and the private sector like the cern open lab that essentially will evaluate and test it of the art uh, technologies on an environment and not necessarily the, the private companies are operating and improve them in, in collaboration with industry. Um, what, what is happening and what is we're trying to do is that we want to create models that can realistically provide researchers with access, managed access across different resources, being on-prem or being um, or being um, off-prem in, in the cloud, addressing not only the technical aspects, but an integration of technical, legal, and economic, economic, economical aspects. And you have some of the questions that our researchers have. So is this cloud offering designed for, for my use? My, can I run my software there? Can I have multiple hundreds of GPUs uh, for my workload? So these are the, 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 the kind of, 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 of questions and the kind of responses that we are trying to give to, to some of the research the researchers and the work, workloads that we have. Um, we also think that investing, and I, I, I didn't mention this before, but the investing in data preservation archive is an insurance policy against uh, against commercial uh, against commercial business practices that might be predatory. Okay, so uh, having trusted exit strategies from the one cloud provider to the other, or from one cloud provider to on-prem, are things that we need to do uh, when using the when using commercial clouds. And then in the end, I mean, it boils down to skills and capacity and, and building skills. So disseminate best practices, experiences, and, and, and have this set of skills for researchers to use uh, modern, modern services across several um, uh, sources effectively when using research environments. And I think that is my last uh, slide, and I probably was on time, I hope. Wow. Wow. Congratulations on doing a presentation yeah. with so much information in such a short time. But thank you yeah. so much. Um, I'm, I'm seeing in the chat that lots of people are uh, very interested in your T-shirt and what text is on your T-shirt. <laughs> yes, this is <laughs> this is like <laughs> I mean this is Lagrangian model that is uh, explaining essentially um, the Higgs the Higgs discovery. But don't wow. ask me more because I'm not a physicist. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Thank you. Now, uh, I have a question from the audience, but yeah. firstly, I also have a question for you. Now, what advice would you like to give institutes who are at the start of developing a virtual research environment for their researchers? So, sorry, I, I, I missed. I'm sorry, I'm losing. No, no I'm worries. What, part a, of what, you, yeah. what, what advice yeah. would you like to give institutes who are right at the beginning of developing a virtual research environment for their researchers. Yeah, I mean, um, what, what advice, advice I can give? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so I think the, the, the first advice that anyone can give is what problem are you trying to solve? Right. Okay. And so from the problem that you're trying to solve, there are probably several solutions and several solutions that they can be more performant, more cost effective, or a mix of both. And then the balance is something that needs to be uh, done in each of the um, of the um, of the environments that you are trying to build. Um, in our case, for example, and I can give you our case, one of the one of the big uh, on the, of the big requirements that we have is scale. As you saw, is scale. So now we're not anymore talking about 
um, the, the amounts and the volumes that you were talking about up to now, but we are talking about 10 times more. And so we have to come, this is the problem that we have to solve. And we have to come with integrated solutions to solve this problem. So I think uh, everything starts from which problem are you trying to solve and what you are trying to achieve, and then um, and then test and validate different scenarios that probably will involve not only public sector uh, actors but public sector in in in, in conjunction with with private sector. But the starting point is what do you want to research? What is the problem? Yes, exactly. 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 Yes. Yeah, okay. Is, thank you so much. Thank you, Joao. I ha oh, uh, uh, we have to finish off, unfortunately, but I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation and okay. um, wish you much of luck. And I'm going to thank our second, uh, second speaker of this afternoon. But thank you for now, Joao. Um, yes, our second speaker of this session is Head of Infrastructure and Engineering Section of the European Space Agency in Austria, Please welcome Gunter Landgraf. Gunter. Hello. I can see you speaking, but I cannot hear you yet. They're working hard behind the scenes. Um, but I will ask my question already, because my question for you is, which challenges do you see at the moment? Which challenges do you see at the moment? Well, probably that I can hear you. <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes, I mean, the challenge is at the moment, I mean, for us, uh, who are doing Earth observation, is really the, the sharing and the collection of the data. Yeah, there's uh, so much to learn on our planet, and we have to bring all our uh, data together. So to bring this data together on performing infrastructures where research can be done, uh, this is really the main challenge. Yeah, the, the cloud computing has made so much process progress that actually the, the, the sheer processing power is not the problem anymore. Uh, right. It's really more access to the data and bringing the data together. Thank you, thank you. And uh, take the floor. <laughs> okay. So let me get my clicker right here. And okay. So I wanted to tell you something about how we. Uh, try to invest in platforms to boost uh, data science and Earth observation. So on this, one of the things that I really want that you take home from this is uh, if someone asks you, uh, but Europe, Europe, yeah, um, is there still any place for Europe is number one? Well, in satellite, in Earth observation from space, Europe is number one. Yeah? We have the best fleet together with our colleagues from the European Commission that we are building at the European Space Agency, and you see all the member states here on the bottom. Um, uh, Europe has the best Earth observation fleet in the world, and let's say, of course, also in the science exploration, we want to be, we want to be the best here. Um, now, the fleet currently, every satellite uh, produces uh, 10 petabytes of data per year, and there are, I think, 20 satellites now. So this, what you see, is the past. We were, someone was producing the data and the users downloaded it on his infrastructure to do its science. This simply does not work anymore with these amounts of data. And uh, fortunately, ICT has come in our help. And you see here two, two layers, and it's important to distinguish the two. So the lower layer, you see here a lot of infrastructure providers that joined with data providers. Basically, what you find here in this resource to data is the infrastructure as a service um, together with the satellite data. So they are readily available on the cloud. You don't need to download them. Yeah? If you want to process all the 10 petabytes of Sentinel-2 data, you just do it on the cloud. And we will help you do that. Um, but you also might not be an Earth observation space data expert. There are, we have quite some cumbersome access formats sometimes. And you may not be a cloud expert. So I really think what is important and what we invested in is this platform layer uh, on the top that you really help you to do your research. And they manage the cloud for you and they manage the observation data for you. And, and you can do your all your analytics there. And I wanted to tell you a bit more on what is happening here. All of together, we call this bring the user to the data. And we are helping this in the net, all of these resources, we call the network of resources that we help you to, to use our community. 
Um, so we have found in the last five years that this changes things a lot. So in reality, there's a new approach. In the past, you had to build your pipe, assemble all ingredients together to get your result. These platforms, it, it's a bit different. There are people that the platforms help you to bring people together to, to share the things in the most efficient way. It's a question uh, of uh, interaction between creators and uh, extractors. And uh, at the end, this creates really an, an environment of co-creation and co-engineering. So really this boosted already a lot. Everyone brings to the platform what you can share, algorithms, data, tools, uh, expertise. And at the end, even what you produce, um, you you share on the platform because what shall you do with it? Uh, show it to your kids? Yes, maybe that's also nice, but share it on the platform and someone else can, can do further things with that. Um, now, what we have invested, uh, what we saw a problem for the community is uh, there's such a lot of things and resources you can use. This has to be structured. So we have invested in thematic platforms, which really offer a tailored environment for a specific community, speak the community language, you get expert advice on what you can do with what data. Um, you have some ready to use algorithms uh, that do the pre-processing you need ready at your fingertips. You don't have to you anymore to download an open source algorithm, install it somewhere, get it working. No, you just ask that it's done. Hosting your algorithm. Yeah, you should focus on doing your science. Someone else can take care of, of running it whenever you need and how often you need it. Next thing that comes, of course, is artificial intelligence. But as I said, with the challenge, the most important thing is really the sharing. Sharing your data, sharing the data of everyone here in the community, and sharing also your results, your number of fair principles, and uh, all of the resources you can find on the on the link below, uh, on, the, on the network of resources discovery portal. And we will help you in using these resources. We will pay pay the bill for you so that you can do efficient science. Uh, another thing we've invested is the data cube, and uh, there is a little video, maybe if this can be started, which explains this much better than, than the slides. Uh, it's actually quite an old video now, and the data cube now has much more data of all the sentinels. Um, and uh, I committed, it, it's running a bit slow. So basically, there's a lot of different information layers that you have in the Earth. You have here surface moisture, temperature, all of these things. Uh, and all of these satellites produce at a global level. Yeah? So we have all of these data available. And uh, uh, the problem was always to exploit them together. Yeah? Because really to understand our Earth, the system Earth, you have to do the correlation between uh, these different things. Yeah. Uh, today, often this is separate products and it presents it to yourself like this. No, if there was 15 different planet Earths together, <laughs> 15 different views, and to combine them was quite cumbersome. Yeah. So what we did, we, we cubed them. Yeah. You can see uh, each of these parameters, the scientific parameters, in a time series. Yeah, so two dimensions of the cube is the Earth's surface, one dimension is the time series, and you can really uh, walk through that. But the most important thing is actually what I would say uh, is, uh, uh, I'm going a bit uh, quite ahead with my explanation. So here we are still in the, uh, to exploit the changes over time, uh, what has happened. Uh, but the, um, the, the most important thing is this fourth dimension yeah, of the different parameters that you can correlate together somehow in, in the data cube. Yeah. And the film is showing an, one example. We have extracted four, these four different parameters. And on my small video, I cannot see now what it is. I hope you can you can see them. <laughs> but they are specifically characterizing uh, drought scenarios. Yeah. 
and we have uh, correlated them uh, together and you can, can then somehow navigate, you find somehow clusters of density uh, characterizing uh, drought situations, extreme events. And uh, if you uh, zoom a bit in or out with also with the, uh, with, with the factorizing, um, you see the, the clouds where things are more dense. Uh, if you if you decrease a bit the resolution, we can see uh, that there was one extreme event. So that was very interesting for us to see, okay, what was that? This is really good characterization. This must have been a very extreme event. And if you go look a bit at the time and where this was, so this was the uh, Russian drought of, uh, oh, I don't remember the year because it was always written, I think, in the Russian drought of 2010, I think. Yes, also it's the, the Russian heat wave of 2010, which of course then created uh, uh, an, an important drought, which quite a lot of damage. So this is the tools, the platforms I speak that are at disposition on this high performance computing environments where all the data are there. And we can go back to the presentation. Um, the all the data there ready at your fingertips to be analyzed and correlated and to to understand a bit uh, more the planet Earth and how we can avoid to do the damage. Yeah, some of you might have heard of the Pangeo in, initiatives um, uh, and, and all of these things uh, is ready available for your use. You can plug in your algorithm in the data cube, really doing pixel based access uh, time series to analyze that and correlate different different layers that are available there. So this is one of the platforms we uh, invest in. The other thing is the OpenAO platform. So the Boston Horizon 2020 project, uh, OpenAO. And we built on this because we saw we really have using this technology uh, the possibility to um, to do something better than uh, than Google Earth Engine. Many much science is done there today in Earth observation, uh, but uh, we should not be dependent on um, uh, on American uh, resources and platforms to do our research in Europe. And we do think we can do something better. So this is our latest investment. It will present it at the fee peak. Yeah, look Google for the fee peak. Uh, that will be is done by ESA every, every autumn. And that will be the big opening and the big presentation of the OpenAO platform. And this really is the brand new resource that you can do your uh, research on, on planet Earth. And uh, I think I would finish my, my presentation with that. Oh, I think I was too short in time here. <laughs> so maybe I caught uh, uh, so some people. In my presentation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really sure, but you packed this information in. <laughs> uh, I, I tried really to do the, the contrary. <laughs> yeah. So consider that all of these resources are uh, actually resources that are mm, operated by, by industry. So it's actually, you have to pay to, to use these resources. And this is a deliberate um, choice because we do think that uh, the commercial cloud providers are today much better equipped to manage these resources than uh, some research institutes. Um, but let's say we want to guarantee free at point of use access for the science community. So um, we, you can come to ESA to ask for sponsoring of these resources for your research project. Yeah. So hello, Gunther. Um, oh, hi, Emily. Hi. <laughs> I was missing you. <laughs> yes. 
I needed to, I needed to go to the toilet. Needs to happen as well. But I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> and thank you so much for your valuable presentation. Now, I have a question from uh, one of our participants, from Raymond, Raymond, and the question is. Is it still very difficult or very costly to get access to large historical EO data sets? How does ESA aim to solve this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I'm, uh, first, thank you, Raymond, that you expect ESA to solve this. <laughs> 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 and not always the European Commission. Now, I mean, the data, the Sentinel data, are open and free. Yeah, so there is no cost of data there. If, of course, for research, you need very high resolution data, so below five meter, below one meter, better than one meter resolution, these are still very costly. Um, but the network of resources is uh, sponsoring you also for access to this type of data. So if your research needs both, we will cover the bill. Yeah, it is the public hand has to intervene here. Um, the other thing that you need is, of course, the, the processing cost. And I have to say, uh, to, to really do exploitation of Earth observation data, the processing cost is, is starting to become marginal. Uh, I mean, if, if you have, uh, want to really a, a super gigantic research and uh, do the forest map of the full planet, it would be around 30,000 euro of processing costs. Uh, and if you really have a super hot idea, um, there are people who sponsor that, either ESO or you may have heard of OCRE, uh, Open Clouds for Research Environments, uh, managed by GR, and uh, they would also uh, eventually sponsor your project for that. So don't worry, think of really the, think big of what research you can do. Now, thank you, Gunther, but Raymond uh, adds on with another question. Does ASA foresee working with more compute centers in a federated sense? And if yes, what possibilities exist to not only bring the users to data, but also vice versa? Okay, that, I mean, that's a very, very in in interesting topic. As I said before, this is really the big challenge. Yeah? Find someone who hosts this data at a reasonable price, and let's say we are uh, today exploiting maybe a, an additional strategy to make more agreements with public data centers, where eventually the data hosting is also uh, funded by the public end. Uh, and we are looking for, for institutional partners uh, in the context of the European Open Science Cloud who are ready to uh, host a big part of the Earth observation data. So we are ready to, to share this data. Um, the question is, uh, who really wants to attract users to his uh, computing infrastructure um, and, and host this data? Thank you, Gunther. And I hope uh, these answers are valuable for you, Raymond. And unfortunately, we can't go into all the other questions, but if you really want an answer, let us know and we can reach out. But I have one final question, Gunther, for two minutes. We have two more minutes. And that is, uh, where will Asia be in five years from now? What do you think? In two minutes. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. On the moon, on Mars, uh, we don't know. I mean, in Earth observation, I think Shoao also mentioned quantum computing. We are also looking into quantum computing, how really we can accelerate to, comp to the things on the fly. We are investing together with uh, um, DigiConnect in a new big project, which is like an Apollo project for us, Digital Twin Earth. DigiConnect calls it Destiny. So really we want to be in a situation where we can simulate, fully simulate all the processes on our Earth to really uh, understand better uh, what we should decide as mankind before we do even more damage. I understand. I understand. Thank you so much for your speech and presentation. And uh, also, Joao, again, thank you. Thank you for all the questions uh, you put in the chat. And um, good luck with all your research and work. And with this, we've come to an end of a session. Uh, this session and we've come 
actually at the wrap up.